From TLDR News, this is your daily briefing for Tuesday, the 20th of December. Good afternoon. In today's Spotlight story, we're going to run through the charges against former President Trump that have been recommended by the January 6th committee. But that's not the only thing happening in the world right now. So we're running through three other stories which are important in the world today. And in our Nebula exclusive section, we'll be explaining why governments are worried about a quantum apocalypse. But first, what has the January 6th committee had to say about Donald Trump? Nearly two years after the attack, and following 18 months of investigation, nine public hearings with over 70 witnesses, yesterday the House Select Committee, tasked with looking into the January 6th attack on the Capitol, held its final public meeting. A meeting in which the committee unanimously voted to refer former President Donald Trump to the Department of Justice for at least four criminal charges. Specifically, the committee voted to refer Trump for the following. The obstruction of an official proceeding, conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to make a false statement, and finally, inciting, assisting, or aiding or comforting an insurrection. These referrals mark the first time in US history that Congress or a congressional committee has recommended criminal charges against a former president. Announcing the committee's decision, Democrat Jamie Raskin stressed that the committee understood the gravity of each and every referral it was making. Just as we understand the magnitude of the crime against democracy, the committee described in its report. Raskin, however, highlights that we have gone where the facts and law lead us, and inescapably, they lead us here. The accompanying report, which is set to be published in full later this week, further adds that evidence has led to an overriding and straightforward conclusion. The central cause of January 6th was one man, former President Donald Trump, who many others followed. None of the events of January 6th would have happened without him. Alongside the former president, the committee further decided to refer five other Trump allies for potential prosecution. Mark Meadows, Trump's final chief of staff, and lawyers Rudy Giuliani, John Eastman, Jeffrey Clark, and Kenneth Chesbro. It must be noted, though, that the DOJ is under no obligation to follow through on the committee's referrals. That's because the referrals, while politically important, carry no legal weight. So it will be up to the DOJ and the DOJ alone to determine whether or not to actually bring criminal charges against Trump at a time when the department is already under immense political pressure. That's because following Trump's announcement that he would, as suspected, stand for president in 2024, Merrick Garland, the US Attorney General, announced that special counsel in the form of Jack Smith, a former war crimes prosecutor at The Hague, would be appointed to oversee the DOJ's criminal investigations into Trump, both relating to the classified documents held at Mar-a-Lago and Trump's alleged role in the January 6th Capitol attack. This move was justified as being in the public interest in the light of the former president's announcement that he would be standing, and the intention of the incumbent president to similarly do so. In any case, if Jack Smith greenlights charging Trump, it's likely to set off an almighty political and legal fight, with the very real potential of destroying any chance of Trump becoming president again. Okay, so that's the biggest story of the day, but there's a lot more going on around the world, so here's a rundown of three other stories. On Monday, Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte issued an apology on behalf of the government for the Netherlands' historic role in slavery and the slave trade. In a 20-minute speech at the Dutch National Archives, Rutte said history is often ugly, painful, and even downright shameful adding that for centuries the Dutch state and its representatives facilitated, stimulated, preserved and profited from slavery, which must be recognised in the clearest terms as a crime against humanity. I apologise, Rutter said, to enslaved people in the past, as well as to their daughters and sons and all the way to their descendants up to the present day. But the formal apology has been met with some criticism. Some campaigners have said that there's been a lack of consolation from the government and that the apology should have been made by the king on the 1st of July 2023 in the former colony of Suriname to mark the 150th anniversary of the end of slavery there. 
Now, there's more on the way, but be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to make the daily briefing part of your daily routine. Or just search for us in your podcast app of choice to listen along. Next up, Sweden's Supreme Court has blocked the extradition of an exiled journalist sought by Turkey in a move that could add further complications to Sweden's bid to join NATO. That's because Turkey wants Sweden to extradite Bulnet Kenish, a former editor of the Zaman Daily newspaper, who the Turkish government accused of being involved in the 2016 attempt to topple President Erdogan. However, Sweden's Supreme Court said that there were several hindrances to sending him back to Turkey, including the political nature of the case and the risk of persecution based on his political beliefs. And this decision could prove difficult for Sweden, because just two NATO countries, Hungary and Turkey, need to ratify the accession of Sweden and Finland into the military alliance. Hungary is set to do so in early 2023, but Turkey is the only NATO member that's threatened to veto the accession bids. Now, an agreement was reached between the countries in June, but Turkey is still holding back on ratifying the applications. Turkey has also accused Sweden in particular of being a safe haven for Kurdish groups that it considers to be terrorist, and wants the Nordic country to take tougher action on things like extradition. Now, the Swedish government has repeatedly said that its country's independent judiciary makes the final decisions on issues like this, but it could make their NATO application at least a little bit harder. As we discussed in another video, recently the Chinese government rolled back their zero COVID policy, with this decision coming on the back of huge protests that threatened President Xi's regime. It's fair to say that the Chinese government wasn't planning on relaxing the policy as quick as they did, and the intensity of the process certainly sped up the relaxing process. But now the policy has actually been ditched. Coronavirus cases are increasing massively in the country, putting China's health system under huge strain. While getting an exact idea of the number of cases is tricky, it's been suggested that several major city hospitals are frantically trying to source ventilators and emergency equipment. In Guangzhou, for example, the number of ICU beds has been increased to 110,000 from only 40,000 in an attempt to keep up with the number of newly infected people with the virus. And this is happening in cities across the country in a demonstration of the severity of this situation. In the final uplifting story of the main section of the Daily Briefing today, we discuss the resurgence of two species on the Galapagos Islands, which were previously thought to be extinct. That's because it's recently been discovered that cactus finches and geckos that were previously thought to be extinct on the islands were actually thriving in restored habitats. For decades, and perhaps even centuries, invasive rodents such as black and Norwegian rats have devastated local populations on the island. But scientists believe that geckos and finches have existed in such small numbers that they weren't able to track their populations until now, when we found out that the species weren't dead and were doing much better than we thought. That's all we have time for on YouTube today, but if you want to see our discussion about why governments are so worried about a quantum apocalypse, then watch the extended ad-free edition of the Daily Briefing over on Nebula. Now might be the time to do it, as there's an offer which gets you a year of membership for less than $1 a month. That's huge because Nebula subscribers not only get everything you've already watched ad-free, but also an extended edition of the show every single day, available to watch on Nebula or stream on your podcast app of choice. They also get access to a ton of other exclusive ad-free TLDR content, as well as videos from all your favourite creators. The good news is, like I mentioned, our friends at CuriosityStream, the streaming service which offers you some of the world's best documentaries, is offering an incredible deal whereby you can get both platforms, CuriosityStream and Nebula, for less than $12 a year. That's all the documentaries you could want on CuriosityStream, and then more TLDR content on Nebula, including the extended briefing, other full exclusive TLDR videos, and it's always ad-free. Click the link below to get both services for less than a dollar a month, a deal which doesn't last long, and support the channel.